Hey everybody, Lars here. Time for the second of three review videos for Big Bad Unit 5. But if you've gotten started, and I hope you have, I know the deadline for the proposal is close to now, so I know many of you are maybe just forgetting about starting Unit 5 right away and working on the proposal. Please, I beg you, just go look over the slides. Just go review things, because if, if, if the initial coat goes on early in the process, then you have time to think about these things. You can think you think about these things in the background without even knowing about it. Get going, because I don't want you to get started on this unit late, because when you see the assignment, at first the assignment's going to, I don't want to scare you, but it's going to freak you out a little, all right? Because you get, you're going to be asked, you're not going to be asked to just code anymore, you're going to be asked to think, and sometimes that freaks people out. You'll see what I mean when you get the assignment, and I want to get you the assignment, Hopefully by Sunday night, maybe by the end of the by the end of the weekend, I want you to get it as early in the process as possible, especially with the Thanksgiving holiday coming up. But we'll go we'll do a little bit, just a little bit of announcement stuff at the end of this video. The major announcements are gonna come at the end of the third video, which hopefully I shoot either, you know, tomorrow or Sunday. Tomorrow's a tough one because I have to go to Trenton and do a professional development event, and we'll actually talk about that in the end of this video, because I may do something along those lines with you guys when we next meet in person. But anyway, that's all for later. Right now, we want to talk about really the second, the middle part of the fifth unit, which is the part that discusses inheritance and polymorphism, which is really two facets of object-oriented programming that come along when we do things in an object-oriented fashion, when we do things with classes. So what I did is I whipped up some code, and we're going to review this class first so you get a review on some of the stuff we did in the previous video because with classes and with object orientation, I've always felt the best thing is to see as many examples as possible. So you got the dice class from the slides. You got that student class from the slides. In the first review video, we did the bank account. And we reviewed some bank account stuff. Now I want to switch gears and do something completely different. So you see yet a fourth class. And in this one, I just did a simple animal. Okay? So as you can see up here with the code, I do some comments. Then I create a class. I'm going to call it animal. In the constructor, I'm going to keep two instance variables. Keep is a bad word to use. You always, I always have to be careful with the words I use when I do these programming classes because I don't want you to think that the constructor persists and these two variables are sitting in some area where the constructor is. It's just an area of memory where this particular object... It gets kooky. You're going to have a big... When you create an object with class animal, instantly... An object is created that manages all of the objects for that class. Okay, it's called the class object. You're going to learn about it in the next video. And basically, there's going to be a little section of memory for your particular object. In our case down here, it's going to be A, which is a terrible name. Hold on. I'll call it my animal because I don't want to just use A. That could get confusing down the line. So when I run this program, I'm going to create an actual object called my animal, and my animal is going to have a little memory space in that class object that's going to keep name and is going to keep weight. Okay, so that's where those things are going to be. You don't need to know this for a test. You don't need to know this for this class. I want you to know this though, because I want you to you know get exposed to the programming features and get exposed to all this stuff. Another point of confusion which I thought about after going back and watching some of the old videos and doing some other stuff, is self. I don't want you to think that you can print self and you'll get the variable name my animal. When I come up here and I say self is my animal, self is a pointer. Pointer. You, you'll get into those later too. Self is the object itself after it's been created. You can print self. If you try printing self, you'll see you get a memory location. That's the memory location where that object is. And again, we're going to kind of deal with that a little bit uh, in the next video because we're going to get to the point where, what if I said print my animal? What would it print? Because we've been printing integers. We've been printing all kinds of stuff, right? But what if I said print my animal? What would happen? We'll deal with that in the next video. But for right now, I just want you to see this animal class. What I do is I create a constructor and it keeps two 
variables, the name of the animal and the weight of the animal, okay? And then I have getters and setters for each of those two variables. So if I get name, it just returns the name. If I set the name, that means I've given the method a name and I want to reset the variable. Now that doesn't happen a lot with initial things because if I'm creating a class, uh, an object for a cat, I know the cat's name, I know the cat's weight. Weight could change though. Maybe a year later I want to use the setter for weight. So that's kind of swift. But things like color, color usually doesn't change with a pet. Um, name, name rarely changes, you know. But it's tradition, you know, convention that you create getters and setters for all of your different uh, variables. So I have getters and setters for the two variables, and then I have one method down here that does something. And it's called speak. So if I run the speak method, it prints sound. Why sound? Because this is a generic animal. I don't know what kind of animal it is. That sound may sound a little bit weird. You're going to understand it by the end of this video. Because we're going to use that to talk about polymorphism. But right now, we want to talk about some other features. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this code. Let's do that right now. And get a space set up. So that we can trace through this code. And you're going to see we finally hit that point where what we're doing is complex enough that we're not going to fit everything on one screen. So you're going to see me sliding up and down, up and down when we talk about tracing code. All right, I run the code and it says Fido and 30. Let's trace through and find out how that happened. <coughs> I run the program. I don't consider the comments. I have a class which, similar to a function, just gets stored in memory because it isn't used yet. So then I have another comment, quite literally the first line of code that gets run in this program is the second to last line right here. I create a variable called my animal and I assign it an object that's going to be created with the animal class and I'm going to give it two parameters. One, the string Fido and the integer 30. So in this memory space for this program, do I have a class called animal? I do. So when I want to create this, I go to the constructor. Here it is, dunder init dunder where I take name and weight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop down here, self.name is going to be equal to Fido, because that's what I took for name. Remember, self is understood, and that is pointing to the object itself. I don't know what that object is when I'm writing the class, but when I run the program to get the object, I now I do know what it is. So that's basically you're saying, hey, this object. If you use other languages, Java, C++, self is this, okay? Um, Weight came in at 30, so self.weight equals 30. I've assigned two instance variables, and then I'm done with the constructor, and I'm done. So now my animal points to an object with two instance variables and a whole bunch of methods that can be run on it. So what do I do in my last line? I run two of those methods. I print, and then in the print line, I say go to my animal and run get name. So what happens? What's my animal? My animal is a variable that points to an object that was created with animal. Do I have a class called animal? Yes, I do. I come up here. What am I looking for? The method get name. Do I have a method called get name? Indeed, I do. And what does it do? It returns self.name. In the line before, self.name was set to Fido, so I return Fido. Okay? So right here, this function will return Fido. And as we can see, that's what got printed up here. MyAnimal.getWeight, same thing. MyAnimal. Do I have a variable called MyAnimal? I do. It holds an object that was created with the animal class. Do I have an animal class? Indeed, I do. You come up here. Does it have a method called getWeight? Yes, it does. So what does getWeight do? Return self.weight. When we ran the constructor, self.weight was set to 30. So I return the value 30 here. That returned Fido. That returned 30. That's the behavior we see up here. Okay, so that's just a little bit, we're just getting started. That's just a little bit of a review about classes and how they work. So what I did down here is I instantiated the class and I got an actual object in the variable myAnimal and now I'm using it to do stuff. So I get the name and I get the weight here. So I just print Fido and 30. It's a little bit of a data dump. All right, now we are going to change things up by talking about what if I wanted to get more specific with my animal and I wanted to create a cat class 
so that I could have cats, all right? But when I have a cat, I just don't want it to have a name and a weight. When I take care of my cats, I want to have a name, I want to have a weight, and I want to have the cat's color. And I also want to know that it's a cat, all right? So, what do I do? Do I have to go through and create a brand new class called cat? Well, yeah. But do I have to go through and recreate all this work I've already done with the animal class? The answer is no, I do not. Because I can inherit from the animal class. Watch. This is best seen if you do it. I'm going to create a class. I'm going to call it cat. Okay? Uh, cat is going to inherit from animal. So I put animal in the parentheses. You'll notice last unit when I created the bank account, I didn't bother with the parens. You don't have to. Dirty little secret. But usually, as you can see up here with animal, what I did was there's blank parens. That's fine. Either one works in this context for Python. But if you're going to inherit, you have to, in parentheses, put what you're going to inherit from. Okay? But I get to go and use all of those things with my new class. But I do have to pay the freight. And the freight I need to pay is this. First thing I'm going to do, let me get a space in there, is I'm going to create the constructor for cat. So, dunder and init. Dunder, what am I going to take? I always take self. I'm going to take name. I'm going to take weight. And I'm going to take color. Because I'm going to add color to my cats, okay? Now, what's the first thing that I need to do? And this is the way you should think about it. When you inherit from a class, think about it like a Mr. Potato Head, all right? The class you're inheriting from is just that blank spud. And what you're going to do is you're going to add things on top of it to get everything, all right? Hold on. Uh, the answer to your question is yes. I'm a grown man who has a Mr. Potato Head within arm's reach. Mr. Potato Head makes me feel good because it's one of the few things in this house that's older than me. I think. Alexa, when was Mr. Potato Head created? Mr. Potato Head was created in 1952. Okay, thank you. So Mr. Potato Head is older than me. You're getting a little, you're getting on there, little spud. Anyway, see the ears, the hat, the glasses, the tongue, all the nonsense? Think about when you inherit a class, you get the base spud and then you add things to it. So when we create our cat class, we're taking animal and we're going to add color to it, all right? But what does that mean? That means we still have to create the underlying object. So what do we want to do? We want to take name and weight and pass them on to the constructor for animal so that we can get an actual animal object to build on. So how do we do that? We need to call the constructor of animal and we do that just by saying the class name and then the method name, which in this case is the constructor, all right? We give it, in this case, we do give it self, all right? When we call the constructor of what we call a super class or a class that you inherit from, you give it that. I'm gonna give it name, name and I'm gonna give it weight, and that's it, okay? I'm not giving it color, it doesn't know what color is. Look, it wants name and weight, so that's what we're gonna give it, all right? But, Cleverly, when we, we're going to give it self of our cat object so it doesn't go and create and have a brand new thing. All right, that's why we're giving it self because we want to make sure it's the cat. Then what do we do? We treat our color just like any old instance variable that we would have. All right? And then we're done. Now color, and I'll do this real quick, needs getters and setters. So get color, self, just return... Uh, self.color done and then def set color self color just lets you reset the color and I wasn't indented properly because I didn't do that so this is just self dot color equal to color just like what we did in the constructor boom and then all of a sudden we've got getters and setters all right now, in order to be complete and to look ahead to what we're going to do when we talk about polymorphism, I'm also going to write a speak method. And what speak is going to do is print. What do you think we're going to print? 
I know I have a cat, so I can give it the correct sound now. So we're going to print meow, all right? And we're done. Look at that. So now we've created a class. We inherit from animal. So now when I get my cat object, I can avail myself of all these different functions and methods. I should say methods, but I, I'm an old dog, so I always say functions. And this is where the variables are kept, okay? So what I do is I call that constructor and I get that object, and I just add color to it. I have getters and setters for my new feature, and I've overwritten the speak so that it gets meow, and you're going to see how I do that in a second. Now, what are we going to do? Whoa, what happened there? I need my exclamation point. I want to be a loud meow. Boom, I'm going to say test it. What am I going to do? I'm going to say cat1. I'm going to assign it a cat object, and I am going to give it a name Felix cat. I'm going to make Felix 50 pounds. There's a story behind that. And for a color, I will make Felix orange. I have a colleague, good friend of mine. Oh, says that Rutgers is full of 50-pound cats. And <laughs> this is the story. When you see a cat on the internet or whatever that weighs 50 pounds, is it the cat's fault? No, it's not the cat's fault. It's the idiot owner that doesn't stop feeding the poor thing. So a lot of the employees at Rutgers, we call them 50-pound cats because they, they don't really know what they're doing and they don't get a lot done. But it's not their fault. It's their bosses that let them get away with the behavior that they have. So we there's, you know, a certain class of employee that we call 50 pound cats. I digress. But whenever I do this example, I always make the cat 50 pounds because <laughs> it's funny. All right. Enough of that nonsense. I created an object, a cat object. And what am I going to do to test that? I'm going to print uh, cat one dot get name and cat one dot get color. And if the computer gods are with us, this is gonna work and we are gonna trace through this code. But as you can see, we've already shot through our length, but we're gonna try and keep it all on one page here. All right, I'm gonna save, I'm gonna run. Oh, look at that, we got it. That's a little off putting, let's get that straight. All right, there we go. All right, it ran, it says Felix Orange. Let's trace through the code. I run this program, skips the comments, puts class animal in memory, puts class cat in memory. Literally the first thing it does, the first thing it really regards is the second to last line. Cat1 is the name of the variable. It's been assigned an object created with the cat class. I'm going to give three arguments or parameters. Felix, the string Felix, an integer 50, and the string orange. So... Do I have a class cat in memory? Indeed, I do. Okay? And cat inherits from a class called animal. Do I have a class called animal? Indeed, I do. So we're in good shape. All right? So now I'm creating a cat object. I want to run the cat constructor. So I come down here. Indeed, I do. I have a dunder init dunder, which is my constructor. Self, which is the pointer to the object when that's created. Name, which is Felix. Weight, which is 50. Color, which is orange. Okay? So we're in good shape. So I drop to the next line. What do we do here? I want to run the constructor of the animal class. And I'm going to do it with name and weight. In this case, Felix and 50. So what happens? I come up here. Is there an animal class? Yes, there is. Does it have a constructor? Yes, it does. Self, Felix, 50. I set this variable equal to Felix. I set this variable equal to 50. I'm done with the constructor. Now the cat object contains an animal object that we can build on top of. So I then take color and just set it like a regular instance variable because that's all it is. It's just a regular instance variable for my new object. Okay? So then I'm done. Boom. This line is done. I have a cat object and it is pointed to by that variable. So I come down here to this print line. Cat.getName. So cat1 is what? Cat1 is a variable, points to an object that was created with a cat class. Do I have a cat class? I do. Does the cat class have a, a method called get name? Dip, 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 dip. Ah, it doesn't. So I'm about to throw an error here. 
Except, first Python asks, hey, does cat inherit from anything? It does, animal. So I go up to animal. Does the animal class have a method called get name? It does. Okay? So because it does return self.name, what was self.name assigned? When we ran the animal constructor, it got assigned Felix, so we return Felix. It's the same, it's the behavior you see right here. Okay? Then the second one gets a little simpler. Cat1, it's a variable. It's pointing to an object created with a cat class. I want to run the method get color. I come to class cat. Do I have a method called get color? I do. Okay, so I return self.color. When we ran the constructor in the line before, self.color was set to orange, so I return orange. Boom. And that's how it works. Okay? Now, if I wanted to, I could run get weight. You can see when I ran get name, I didn't write a get name for cat. It went and it inherited from animal, so it did all of the animal stuff itself. All right? Now, we're going to switch gears ever so slightly when I type this. Cat1.speak. Okay? Does the printing automatically, so I just have to run the method. And when I run this, I see meow. All right? This is an example of what we call polymorphism. And real fast, we get the term polymorphism if you break it down. Poly, many. Morph, okay? A lot of people in these times hear morph and they think change. But morph, back in the old days, also meant form. Okay, and that's the definition as far as the etymology of this term that we want to look think about right now. Many forms, okay, and that's the synchronon of what we're doing with polymorphism. I can have different classes and different objects that have methods with the same name, but they perform different functions depending on their context, depending on what class or object they're part of. So I can have a speak method in animal. But it's so generic that it doesn't really do anything, which is why I printed sound. You're going to see, as you get more sophisticated in your programming careers, that a lot of times with generic classes like an animal would be, you have methods that are really never meant to be instantiated. They're meant to be placeholders to remind the programmer that, hey, when you inherit from this, Make sure you override this function. And that's basically what we're doing here. We are saying, hey, when you inherit from animal, make sure you do your own speak method because you're going to want to make sure that you don't use our generic thing. Another thing, sometimes people will just do this. You can see the keyword pass. And that will be a generic method where people will say, okay, that doesn't do anything, but I want to override it so that it does meow. And you know what? I'll leave that pass there and we'll check out what the behavior is. So when I run this cat1.speak, what's cat1? It's a variable. It is assigned an object created with the cat class. I go to the cat class. Is there a method called speak? There is. And what does it do? It prints meow, which is the behavior you saw right here. I didn't return anything back. It wasn't fruitful. It just went ahead and did what it did so I can run it out here in space. Okay? Now, what if I comment that out so that cat1.speak cat1 variable holds an object created with cat. I come up here to cat. Is there a speak method? No. So did cat inherit from something? Yes. Animal. I come up to animal. Is there a speak method? Yes, there is, but it doesn't do anything. So I'm guessing we're going to get a blank line. I'm hoping that's the behavior we'll get. We'll go back and change it. So we get a blank line. It doesn't do anything right now. It doesn't speak. If we went back and we changed that so that we print sound, you'll see that's the behavior we get. It prints sound now. Because what happens is I go up to cat and I look for speak. Speak doesn't exist. So I go to animal. And if it does exist, which it does here, I run that one. Okay? I can leave the pass there because pass just doesn't do anything. It, if I had nothing there, you'd get an error. I think. Yeah. Unexpected indent. Yeah, it expects something if you create a function. You can't just leave it blank. So I, it's, it's almost like there's the start a new block, 
and then I'm out of indent and I'm starting a class. So Python is like, what the hell is going on here? If I put pass there, it's like, okay, you know what? Take that. Take that, Python. Take that for the body of my method, but don't do anything. I don't want you to do anything. And generally, it's so you can do what are called like abstract methods. We have abstract classes, which are never meant to be instantiated. They're meant to be used as the base for inheritance. That gets really wonky and really into the woods. I don't want to freak you yet, so don't worry about that. But that's basically what the behavior is. Um, for you to play around with, I'm going to bring this back to print sound and lose the pass for the time being so that when I put this up on the web, which I will, you will have the print sound and you'll understand as far as that's concerned, okay? But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go grab the behavior I want. I overrode that for a reason because I want my cat to say meow, all right? And the reason is with polymorphism, if I override these different functions when I create these classes, when I have a dog object, it's going to say woof. Cow's going to say moo. Pig's going to say oink. Cat's going to say meow. All right? But I'm just running speak on it. So if you think about, say you had a list with 20 different objects, right? And you ran speak on all of them, you only need that one little command. Whatever the object is, dot speak, and you'll get all different results because the different objects have different voices. So you'll get, you know, meow, meow, woof, woof, moo, moo, oink, moo, woof, woof. <laughs> I couldn't do that twice if I had to. All right? So that's kind of the reasoning behind it. And here it's a simple thing making an animal speak. But in another context, um, there could be a function which would perform one way for one object and could perform a completely different way for another object. But you would call it the same way. And that's what we call polymorphism. Okay, And with object orientation, polymorphism is something you can do. It comes along for the ride. Okay, because when you, you, a lot of times you'll set a base class, like think about it, if you had a base class, I don't know, from the slides, like a boat, you would have a base class boat, but then you would inherit from that base class and you'd create a tugboat, a speed boat, a cigarette boat, a whole bunch of different kinds of boats, which would have different features and different add-ons, like we added on color here, and you would still be able to use the base functionality of the, the base or the, or the abstract class. So the whole idea that it gets around, and this is a, one of the big features of object orientation, and it's one of the things that kind of pushed it in the 80s and 90s for programmers, is what's called code reuse. Once you've coded something up, we don't want to waste our time coding it again. So kind of like what we talked about with modularity and making libraries in unit three, when I create that sum of squares or that square of sums function, I put it in a library. I never have to write it again. I have it. It's there for me. In a lot of ways, that's what the Python standard library is. It's like, look, we wrote all this code already. Go use it. Just go, you know, read the API documentation and go use the code we're giving you because there's a ton of code out there. We don't want people wasting their time and rewriting it, okay? Sometimes you have to. You got to glue pieces together. You want to make things do what you need them to do. You got to learn. So you're going to want to try everything a couple of times before you start using other code. Get that. But at the end of the day, code reuse is a big thing. So if you have a car class and the functionality of a car for wheels, the engine, the axle, the way things work is going to be the same generally with all cars. You just want to do that once and then have everything else use that general functionality. And that's kind of the design idea behind object orientation. We created our cats, cats, oh, I mean our animal. All animals have names, if you know, they're pets. All animals have weight, we're gonna take care of that with a base class. Most animals speak. That's a good question, are there any animals that don't? I guess if you, would, you count worms as animals and things like that, or maybe insects, they don't speak, but whatever. You get what I'm, I mean. If you have something that's general, then you create that abstract class that you inherit from, and then you could inherit like we did here with cat. Inheritance allows us to go use the functionality of a base class or something generic that we created, so we don't have to write all those methods all over again. Polymorphism, many forms, allows us to write over methods with the same name so that different objects have different functionality but the same name so that we can call it on that object and get a different result depending on the context. Here, we do it with the speak method. So I have an animal that doesn't that just says sound because it's generic. When I write over it, 
in my cat class, I'm going to make the cat say meow. And as you're going to see tomorrow, we're going to add a dog. So I'm going to add the dog class. Dog's going to say woof. We're going to have a bunch of different animals in our little, little animal zoo here. Okay? So that's about it. That's inheritance, and that's polymorphism, all right? Like I said, I'm not going to kill you with announcements because there is one more video coming, and hopefully it may come. I don't know if it's going to come tomorrow night or not. I got a pretty long day. I have to be down at TCNJ. I'm doing a PD on Python down there for New Jersey high school teachers. And it's kind of cool, and it's kind of got me thinking about what I'm going to do with our last class. I'm going to do some Python for a little bit of our last class, but I was also thinking about maybe showing you guys some of the gaming stuff I do uh, with Minecraft, and more importantly, the stuff I do with Pygame. Uh, so we may do that tomorrow when I go talk to all these teachers. I spend the first half of the day basically running through the basics of this course. Uh, I put some stuff online for them so that they can get to the videos and they can go and teach themselves. You can't, no one's going to learn Python in a day. It's silly. So what I do is I do a greatest hits show in the morning and I tell them about the same things I'm telling you guys. Data, simple if then. Then we move on to sequences and lists and strings. Then we move on to a little something with functions and modularity. All right. I skip over object orientation. I skip over data structures. But then in the second half of the day, we talk about some of the stuff that I do as far as using games. Games are a pain with computer science because kids walk in the door and they say, I want to do games, I want to do games. And then you have to sit them down and say, well, first you need to learn a language. Then you need to learn a game framework. Then you need that, that, that. And there's so much work, it just just takes all the fun right out of them. You can see the, the glow in their eyes go away. It's like, oh my God, this is too much. I don't want to do that. So, I mean, it's... The, the bane of all computer ed educators, that kids want to do games, they're excited, they're geeked, they're super, super motivated, and then you can't really let them do games because it's too complicated. Ways around that are starting to crop up. There's a website called Sploder, which lets you, you know, set limits and play games and do some different things. There's also, what I like to do is now, things are getting a little easier as far as using Python with Minecraft. Minecraft, if you know anything about it, is written in Java, okay? So first, if you want to use Python, you've got to get a, a translator running that takes your Python code and runs it. It actually turns it into Java code and then you run the Java code. And there's finally, and it's been a while because it, it was a long time where most of the products out there weren't very good, but there's a book out right now, Learn to Program with Minecraft, that if you can see anything on this slide, it allows you to write Python, like Python, and do things inside a mine, uh, Minecraft game. So you would start up a shared game that comes off a server that you run on your computer, and you can go in a loop and build blocks. As you can see, I build a bunch of lemon, uh, lemon? No, melon blocks. You can grab redstone, you can grab sand, you can grab concrete, you know, cobble, whatever, and, and build right up the line on the Minecraft. You can transport in different places. You can do a lot of different things. So you can, all the kids love Minecraft, if you can teach them programming concepts, iteration, you know, simple arithmetic, things like that, and do it in a Minecraft setting, the kids like it, the kid, and the kids dig it, and they get experience. You know, here I use idle, but you can use whatever you want um, in order to do things in Minecraft. And you can say, oh, not only is it easy to do this programming interface with Python, but the kit's utilitarian. The kids see that they can actually do something with it. So I thought I might do some stuff along those lines when we meet in December. But that's still far ahead. The only announcement I'm going to give you, because it's three days away, is the proposals are due, okay? Some people are sending me emails, which is a good thing. I'm more than happy to answer emails if people say, hey, does this count? Does this doesn't count? Blah, blah, blah. Um, hopefully Sunday night I'll do the third video because I'm going to be tired tomorrow. I don't know if I'm going to sit down and do it. I might, you know, I because I want to get it done. I want you to get all the resources. But if not, I'll do it Sunday night. And yes, of course, Alienware. Why would there not be an upgrade discount in the middle of my video? Um, I'm going to get you all that stuff as early as possible because then I can get you the assignment and you'll be set. 
and you'll have the Thanksgiving break and then you'll have all of the next week to get it done, to work on it, to think about it, to consider it, and to do all of that stuff. Um, keep doing what you're doing. Like I always say, this class is doing well. And I will do more announcements after the second video, which will probably darken your doorstep in a couple of days. All right? Then you be good. I'm going to get out of here. You have a great weekend, and I'm going to talk to you in the next couple of days. All right? All right. Bye.